what it is, what it do, cyber world. It is your girl, the one and only Ash Said It, Ash Said It.com, Ash Said It.com, baby babies. I appreciate each and every one of you guys for supporting the movement, which is Ash Said It. Yes, we've got well over 250,000 listens worldwide, and I would not have been able to get that if it wasn't for you guys supporting me. The shares, the likes, everything has come to this moment, and I really appreciate each and every one of you. I tell you every show, and I'm going to continue to tell you every single show. So today I have the pleasure of having me, Mrs. Janet Lombardi. Hi, Janet. How are you? Hi, Ash. How are you today? <laughs> I'm doing pretty awesome. I'm doing awesome today. Let our listeners know where are you from. What cities do you represent? I live uh, in Rockville Center, New York, which is a suburb just outside of New York City. Awesome, awesome. All right, so we're going to jump into this book, Bankruptcy, A Love Story. So let's uh, let's jump into it, Janet. Let's talk about when you met your husband. What was that experience uh -huh. like? Uh, I met my husband in the early 1980s, and he was a young attorney. In fact, when I met him, he was studying for the bar exam um, in New York, and he lived in Manhattan, and I had grown up in Brooklyn, and had moved to Manhattan around the same time. I was an, an aspiring writer. He was an aspiring attorney, and uh, we met and kind of lived a very nice life in the city, kind of exploring what New York had to offer in the, in the 80s. You know, mm -hmm. it was kind of a great place back then. But we enjoyed music and um, just kind of, a, you know, a, a lifestyle that, that was, uh, you know, kind of filled with all those kinds of things that went with that. Absolutely. So when did you make this shocking discovery that your husband was living the secret life? Hmm. Well, we had been married about 25 years. Um, in fact, I was planning uh, a, a trip to Sorrento, Italy in uh, January of that year to celebrate our 25th wedding anniversary, and I uh, called my financial advisor, who was uh, someone that we had been meeting with, but I had found that statements our financial statements that come were coming every year at the end of the year hadn't come that year. So I called uh, him up and said, you know, where are the statements? And I fully expected him to say, oh, they're on their way, or they're this, or they're that. And he actually responded very bluntly and said to me, you'd better ask your husband um, and then get yourself a good lawyer, a good accountant, and oh a private goodness. eye. And I got very nervous at that point. And, you know, things were starting to unravel a little bit, even before that phone call. Yeah. Um, my husband had been arrested for DWI. I found out that he borrowed money from his father. So when my financial advisor told me that, I really sat up and listened. I always define that as the watershed moment yeah. of discovering that something was very wrong. Absolutely. So from that step of, you know, that's your first red flag, what was the next move that you made? Well, um, I was very surprised, obviously, very upset, and I confronted my husband about it, and then I dove into our family finances mm -hmm. to find that there were hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt and a mortgage that was kind of sprinting towards foreclosure. He'd been paying our real estate taxes on a credit card. There were money grant statements. Um, so and it took me months for making it sound like it was a simple process, no. but it actually took me months uh, to go through everything. Uh, I later discovered that he had uh, a drug problem and there was a pending bar association investigation. So this was all unfolding over, you know, over some time. But that, you know, was what I did to respond to that was to find out what was really going on in our finances. I tried to explore the bottom line and did it with trying to take the emotion out of it, even though it was a very emotional time, um, and and ended up making some very serious financial decisions, such as uh, the decision to sell our house, yeah. which I loved in my house, and yeah. that was a very sad, hard thing for me. But, you know, as I tell people um, that I coach in financial recovery, that sometimes you have to make choices that are going to be painful, but that will help you get uh, solvent and on the road to financial recovery. Wow. 
So while all this is going on, what is your emotional state of mind? Well, uh, I cried every day. Um, I really was um, shocked. I didn't know if this was the person that, uh, you know, who was this man. Um, you know, we had two children. Um, and so I, so after some time, I, I, I realized that I really, I was a person that needed to kind of save myself and yeah. the family. Yeah. Certainly, as I discovered that my husband was, was being prosecuted, um, he did um, serve time in New York State prison. Uh, we did eventually, you know, get divorced after that. But yeah. um, at that time, I was really in survival mode. Um, yeah. I didn't know what was going to become of us. I ab knew absolutely nothing about any, any of his business um, his, that he was involved in. Uh, in fact, I got left kind of holding the financial bag because there was uh, one line of credit that had my name attached to it. Mm -hmm. The mortgage had my name on it. And so... Uh -huh. I was very busy trying to divest myself of, of the uh, financial mess that, yeah. you know, that she had made and that, you know, I had discovered. Absolutely. And that's one thing that um, I have a, a history of working in the court system and credit is big, especially with people that are mm -hmm. married. And I think a lot of people don't realize that um, mm -hmm. when you're married, essentially you're, you're, you're one unit, you're one entity. So... Mm -hmm. Your par your partner, your spouse, if they choose to go and get a car, or or get mm -hmm. some kind of property in your name, they can do that legally. It can be done. Yes. And um, unfortunately, it just it happens, and um, it's just an unfortunate set of events for anyone to go through. Um, right. I think so. that one of the things that happens, or is that people are really don't take complete responsibility for their own finances. That too. Yeah. Every adult needs to take responsibility for his or her own finances, whether they're single or married or whatever. You need to know what the state of the accounts are. Yeah. You, know, you need to know how you're going to work together on this as a team. Uh, it's fine for one person to sort of wrangle the, the money management, you know, and pay the bills, but you need to check in, you know, at least monthly, I would yeah. say, to see what the situation is, so that mm. nobody ever gets blindsided, mm. because you see what's there. So you see it in black and white. And that's another really important point, is that everyone needs to have financial awareness, and that means understanding what you owe, what you own, and what you owe. Absolutely. So looking back, were there any signs that maybe you possibly didn't see or was hidden well or anything? Yes. Um, mm. Yeah, I think that there are some telltale signs that your spouse might be uh, financially unfaithful. Mm. Um, one is a discussion about money is a very normal and natural thing. And someone who doesn't want to discuss money, who won't sit down and review the finances, may be hiding some damage. Um, when I would ask my husband to sit down with me and go over things, he would kind of say, let's do it later, or, let's do it tomorrow, I don't have this, or, I'm waiting for that. There was always an excuse. So he was afraid, basically. Mm. And he was, you know, he was hiding things. Yeah. Um, somebody uh, who won't show you, you know, their bills or their statements or their credit report, uh, somebody, you know, who is kind of stalling and sharing the hard evidence, that's definitely a red flag. And someone who um, won't discuss his or her own habits, yeah. um, that may be scrutinizing your spending. That's mm -hmm. kind of what I would call a Teflon effect, right? Because I'm willing to talk about you. We're going to make it about you. Mm -hmm. but let's, let's not bring any attention to me, right? Yeah. So I think that that's a... And, and the other thing is that some, um, sometimes it's compulsive debtors also tend to like throw mail away or hoard mail. Mm -hmm. So they're... You know, you might find a, a stash of unopened um, bills. That's an, that's another thing. I'm sure there are many more, but in my that was my experience. Absolutely. And how did? Oh, wow, I don't even know how to jump into this. How did this situation impact the family? You know, you said you had children. How were they reacting to this? Yes, yes, we have um, two sons, um, and at the time. In 2010, when my husband was going off to, you know, to serve um, in time to time in prison, mm -hmm. I had one son in college, and the other son was about to, was in high school. So, um, luckily, I think for us, we had really been very loving parents, 
Mm -hmm. And um, I, our children are very close. We're very close to us. So that when things unraveled, it wasn't sort of a progression of some really horrible behaviors or things like that that yeah. were going on. Yeah. So, you know, we, we continue to have very good relationships with our children. I think the thing that I did personally in, um, well, when I sold my house, I went to live with my sister and brother-in-law for two years. But I want to add that point because that's a, a big factor. Yeah. Um, because I wanted to get back on my feet financially, and so I was able to save some money. And I was also able to, to pay for my younger son's college tuition. I had to pay that. I wanted to pay it out of pocket. I didn't want to have to, bring, you know, take him out of school. So I tried to keep my children's lives as normal as, as they could be. Right. Um, so, yeah, so, uh, you know, and, and, and today, you know, uh, they have a very good relationship with their dad, and, and, and their dad and I have a very good friendship. Absolutely. So with all of that's happened to you in the, over a decade now, well over a decade. Right. Um, what advice or what, what have you learned at the end of the day with this situation pretty much uh, put to rest? Right, that's a great question. Uh, looking back on it all, I realized that it's very important if you're finding yourself in a financial situation, not to wring your hands for too long, yeah. because rarely will a bad financial situation get better on its own. Yeah. So you need to, you know, I think that um, my taking the emotion out of it and looking at things logically and saying, okay, you know, what do I need to do? I was very determined. Yeah to get out of the financial mess and um, and, and the emotional mess as well. I yeah. did not want any chaos in my life anymore. I really wanted to simplify things. So, you know, I learned that I didn't realize how determined a person I could be. Mm -hmm. But I also learned um, that it's very important to, to, to I want to say, be compassionate, right. and which isn't an easy thing to do do or be in a situation where you feel like you've been betrayed, yeah. but one of the things that I recognize, and this was a, a kind of a aha moment for me, mm -hmm. but I realized that my husband didn't do it to me, that he just did it, right. that he wasn't doing something to harm me. In fact, you know, in some respects, my not knowing anything about it, he may have been trying to protect me, but, you know, not that I didn't feel the effect of it, and not that I didn't feel angry and still... Yeah. Today can can feel angry if mm -hmm. I, you know, if you get kind of worked up about it. But I don't hold on to that feeling of um, victim. I don't want to ever be, you know, feeling like a victim. Yeah. Um, I want to recognize my role in what happened in terms of our our marriage. Not of course, not in terms of what anything that he did, which I knew nothing about. Yeah. But just in terms of my our marriage, you know, it was not perfect. There were circumstances um, that, you know, it, it was, that added to kind of the perfect storm. Okay. So I wanted to recognize that and look at my own behavior and, um, you know, and to to understand that there's, there's forgiveness is a very important thing as well because I don't want to carry that resentment around. Right. You know, I want to forgive and move on in my life. Absolutely. All right, Janet Lombardi, Bankruptcy, A Love Story. Let everyone know if they want to pick up this book, if they want to just scoop it up and read through your life story. I mean, I, I applaud you and I tip my hat to you for being so vulnerable. A lot of people that have probably gone through similar situations probably would not be as vocal. Thank so, you. Um, yes. Um, yeah, the book um, can be found on Amazon, uh, paperback and Kindle version. Awesome, awesome sauce. And if people need to get in contact with you, Janet, uh, what's the best way for them to reach you? JanetLombardi.com. Sounds like a plan. Janet, thank you so much for being a part of the show today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> no problem. And thank you guys for downloading the program. I appreciate each and every one of you guys. Keep in mind, anyone to tell you that you can't do what you want to do, you look them square in the face and tell them, don't believe me, just watch. Watch what I do. Watch me make it happen. Watch me make history. Because that's what we're doing this for. We're doing this for the history books. Social media is nice, but real life is so much better. I will talk to you guys later.